Hello, friends. Welcome back to my channel. I'm Elliot Parker, and whether you're a writer, a reader, or just a lover of words, I invite you to stop what you're doing and join me for a page break. And I'm so delighted to have poet and author Sandra Marchetti on with us today to talk about two things that you might think don't go well together, and that is poetry and baseball. But she has managed to put together a wonderful collection of poetry that speaks more uh, about uh, the human condition and the human experience in addition to the great game that is baseball. So I'm delighted to talk to her today about her brand new poetry collection. It is called Isle 228, and this is Sandra's second full-length collection of poetry. She's also the author of the poetry collection Confluence from Sundress Publications, as well as four chapbooks of poetry and lyric essays. Her baseball poetry appears widely in Poet Lore, Blackbird, Baseball Prospectus, Southwest Review, Fangraphs, and elsewhere. Her prose on the game can be found at Barrel House, Fan Sided, Hobart, and Pleadies. She is a poetry, uh, the poetry editor emerita at River Sticks Magazine, and she also earned her MFA in creative writing in poetry from George Mason University. Currently, she serves as the coordinator of tutoring, tutoring services at the College of DuPage in the Chicagoland area, and we're talking to her about her brand new collection. It's called Isle 228. Sandy, hold that up so we can get a good look at that wonderful cover, and that tells you all you need to know about the subject matter there. There's Wrigley Field. There's the lights on top of the stadium. Uh, and I'm just so delighted to talk to you today about this great new collection of poems. Um, and so welcome, and thanks so much for taking a page break with us. Thank you. This is wonderful. I want to ask you about something. I, I was reading some other interviews and, and listening to some other interviews that you've given since your book came out uh, not too long ago. And one of the things that you said, which which really struck me because I hadn't considered it, when I was thinking about your collection is you were so excited that this collection of poems, Isle 228, is getting people to read poetry again, or maybe yeah. read poetry for the first time, depending on their experience. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about why that's important and what that means to you as, as a writer and as a poet to have people accessing the genre of poetry, either for the first time or maybe coming back to it for after being away from it for a while? Sure. Yeah. No, I think that, you know, our society has a lot of connotations when it comes to the word poetry. If you say that word out loud, people have various different reactions. I think a lot of them stem from like so many things, our childhood. You know, some folks think that, okay, this is going to be boring or I'm not going to understand it or, you know, it never interested me before. Other people have really positive connotations, but only can think of poetry in certain ways. Like when we talk about death or marriage or you know, things like that. So I think for me, I've always wanted to cast a wide net and have, find my readers wherever they are. Finding my audience is really important to me. That's really the only reason that I publish my work is because I want to find readers and have conversations with them, folks that are like-minded about some of these topics and learn from them. And so for me, it's just been really meaningful to hear from folks who have never picked up a book of poetry before, or the last poem they read was mandatory reading in a high school or college class. I mean, that's just fantastic. When I've devoted my whole life, you know, the last 20 years of my life to being a poet, to feel like you're maybe broadening the genre a little bit, like, and, you know, I, I just, I, I guess I never thought that my book would be the one in some of these folks' hands for the first time af after all those years, you know, and people, I, I've just been blessed, like people will come to readings and they will like be crying after they hear a poem, they'll say this poem reminds me of my father, or I wish my grandfather could have heard this, or and then there's also the poets and the poetry readers who say I really don't like baseball or sports ball is stupid, you know, like, but they're like, this is really beautiful work. It could be about anything. And those compliments are just so warming to me. It's, it's amazing to feel like you're, it's a little bit weird because you feel like, how do you kind of get the message out to both of these audiences and the way they receive the work is very different. I think the sports fans hook on to the narrative, whereas the uh, poetry fan fans hook on to, you know, more of the craft. But um, it's been really fulfilling. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. So let's start with the title. Where is Isle 228? Where, where is that at Wrigley Field? Where is that? And, and who sits there besides yourself? Why is that, that so special? And why did you decide to title your collection Isle 228? Yeah. So the first poem in the book is titled Frame. 
And it's a poem that I wrote in 2014, I believe, about, and I think it's the first poem I wrote for the collection. And it's basically a perspective of me sitting in a seat in aisle 228. And that's kind of where at least the first half of the book kind of takes place from that seat perspective, right? Looking out on Wrigley Field from that seat. So aisle 228, they've now changed the numbers, sadly, and they've kind of renamed them as sections, but they used to be called aisles. Um, even up just just a couple of years ago, um, is right is in the box seats in the second set of box seats, sort of I think terrace reserved behind um, first base, um, on the you know first first level of seating, and it's it's almost directly behind first base, um, and a little little bit up in the grandstand, and um, I I sat in those seats with my father for maybe eight to 10 to 12 games a year for about 20 years. Um, and those were season tickets that one of his uh, customers from his, he, he worked a sales job and one of his customers um, had those season tickets and he bought them from, from that guy for many, many years. And actually um, that, that man ended up selling the tickets after the 2014 season because he he was like, the team is terrible and I don't want to watch this. And my father and I, mostly my father tried to convince him, no, they're on the upswing. They're going to be good soon. And then of course this, this guy was really unhappy the next couple of years when they went to the NLCS and won the world series. So, uh, but yeah, so, so that's kind of the reason I titled the collection that way is because, you know, I think a lot of the experiences detailed in the book, um, and the course of my growing up really happened. I returned to those seats so often during that period that it just provided a really nice uh, baseline, I think, for the collection. And, and as you mentioned, in, in 20 years of watching the Cubs, and, and I know that there's probably a lot of Cubs fans watching uh, our interview today, and a lot of Cubs fans are constantly on the internet and constantly, you know, watching on MLB TV and downloading mm -hmm apps to wallet to watch games and follow the team you certainly have seen a lot of winning and losing uh unfortunately more losing maybe than winning uh yeah. and i'm a cubs fan too so i, I right there with you suffering for through all of yeah. that i like yeah. how you kind of divide the collection up you kind of play the collection up on that theme of, of winning and losing or winners and losers how did yeah. you decide to do that was that something you kind of knew going in you were going to do or as the poems were coming together you just realized oh wait a minute I've got some some poems focusing on winning and then we've got this other section of poems focusing more on losing yeah no I I think for me you know I it's funny because I've done some interviews like you said where folks have said this collection's really not I don't see it as chronological um but in my mind it is sort of chronological which I think one person mentioned to me, a very, very smart fiction writer who I really love his work. Um, he was like, I think organizing this collection chronologically would be the hardest thing you could do. And um, he, I, I just, to be honest with you, feel like my brain did not allow me to see it a different way. I, <laughs> I tried, I really thought about his advice because I was like, this guy is really successful and I like his work. Like I want, I want, what he has like how do I do that and I couldn't figure it out and I thought you know really I want to start from the 60s with some of my father's memories and then I want to try to take it to present day but when I started writing the collection in 2013 2014 you know like we said the Cubs were really bad you know they, they were not end of 2014 we maybe started seeing some hope um, but you know, there were some glimmers, but before then it was pretty rough going, you know? Um, and so for me, I thought, okay, um, why don't we kind of look at it from, why don't we just start writing it and look at those older memories? And unfortunately there are even poems in that loser section that are about small victories, like Carrie Wood's 20 strikeout game. That's still in the loser section, you know, because it came before, um, before the big win. And then what I would say is that 2017 or so, after the Cubs won the World Series, that really accelerated my writing. I wrote a lot of poems in that 2015, 2016 era. And then around 2017, there were several people who were clamoring and saying, you should publish this book now. You should try to get it out now. But it just wasn't going to really work out for me, given um, the fact that the collection just wasn't done yet. 
Um, and then, but by the time I was actually ready, 2018, 2019, to send it out, I had a good amount of poems about the World Series win and, and kind of some World Series, other World Series memories and things like that. So I was able to kind of look at it and say, okay, any sort of Cubs book, you don't want to end with the loser section. So let's put the loser section first <laughs> and then end on a high note. You know, you don't want to end on like a Rajay Davis home run. So so that's just how, how we ended up going with it. And I, and I like it. I think, you know, there's always the three act version. You could go that way. You could do different things. But I think the way it worked out, it makes sense to me. Hopefully readers feel the same. <laughs> very well said very well said i one of the things i love too you, you mentioned your father and sort of starting the collection you know back in yeah. the 60s from his experience and i love that that theme really runs through all of your poems no matter what section it's in sort of the winner section or the loser section is that mm -hmm. it, they are poems about baseball but they're really about the relationship with your father through this mm -hmm. medium of baseball mm -hmm. what is it about the game that has been so special for you and him and your father-daughter relationship or daughter-father yeah. relationship that you've had. What, what is it about the game and going to Wrigley and, and watching all of these games that, that has helped kind of uh, define your relationship, cement mm -hmm. your relationship in a lot of ways? How, how has that come together through baseball? Yeah, so I'll start with a little story, which is that on my wedding day in September of 2012, um, I was waiting with my father to go out and get married. Like we were under this threshold and he was about to walk me to the altar. And we were talking about the pennant race. We were talking about the Orioles <laughs> and the Orioles are not, you know, even a team that either of us root for. We don't know, have any friends who are Oriole fans, you know, but we follow the whole league. And um, <laughs> we're talking about, are they going to make the playoffs? Could, could they make a run? And that's just very, t you know, I'm standing there in a white dress, you know, high heels, the whole deal. And we're talking about, we're talking about pennant races. So, you know, that just kind of shows you our relationship. Um, we're, you know, we, we have a, we have a good relationship. We see each other often, but I think baseball is, a, you know, for lack of a better term, it's a love language, you know, like it's a, it's something that we have in common he taught me the strike zone, you know, when I was very young, I watched lots of games when, with him um, when I was a kid in our toy room, which is our den, you know, I'd be combing Barbie's hair and he'd be combing Barbie's hair and we'd be watching, you know, baseball games. And that was just our time together. You know, for a long time, my mother worked at night um, at retail stores, you know, like at the mall and, he would get home from work around seven and he would take care of me and we'd just watch ball games, you know? Um, and he's all, he was a baseball player. He lived on the North side of Chicago as a kid. He grew up down there. He used to go to games as a kid at Wrigley field. So, you know, he's a little bit of a curmudgeonly guy, I would say. And he's also, he's more talkative now, but he was always a quiet person. And this was something that we could really bond over and enjoy. And you could get him talking about it, you know, like any player, any prospect, you know, he, he has something to say about it because he's very sharp. So, um, you know, I think that was a real part of it. Like, I think with other people, you know, they're, there are the, there were a few subjects with him where you could really get him going and baseball was one of them. And, you know, I mean, he's, he's in his seventies now, he's super active and, you know, really living his best life, I think in a lot of ways, but I think those eight to 10 games we go to every summer are really important for us. Um, and it's one of those things, just like a hundred listening to 162 games on the radio or whatever you listen you hear those you feel those gradual changes you know in your relationship someone's aging someone was talking about it this book is a coming of age story and I think it it is that you know there's just a lot of like little changes to the neighborhood where we walk down to the ballpark and you know to the team and how you mark time through the games you know that stuff's really grounding and really important. You know, when I, when I was going to start making a career for myself, I really didn't want to move away from this area. 
And one of the big reasons was because I wanted to continue to go to baseball games with my dad at Wrigley Field. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Sandy Marchetti is our guest. She's taking a page break with us today. She is the author of the brand new poetry collection called Aisle 228. Sandy, hold that up for us again. We'll get another oh. look at the cover there. There you go. Mm -hmm. Aisle 228, the lights in, of Wrigley Field in the background. And look at that. Even the lights on the back cover as well. It's, it's a terrific collection of poems and uh, folks that have been away from poetry or been afraid to get into poetry for a long time, you're going to want to pick this up, particularly if you're a baseball fan or if you know someone who's a Chicago Cubs fan, you're yeah. going to love this collection. So, Sandy, we're going to stop talking about the book for just a second because we are now getting ready to put you on the author hot seat, which is something we like to do every time we have a guest here on page. Okay. So we're just going to ask you about 10 rapid fire questions just to let our audience know a little bit more about you. Some of these may be writing related or theme related, and some of them just may be random questions to get us more acquainted with you. So feel free to elaborate on as much as you want or just give as short of an answer as you want. So are you ready to be on the hot seat? I'm ready for the lightning round. Yes. All right. Excellent. First question. What is one thing you love about baseball? Uh, I think I love that everything it comes in threes, three strikes, three outs, uh, nine innings. You know, I love that symmetry of the game. Why do you think people are so afraid of poetry? I think because they've learned to read it wrong. I think if we just knew that part of the reason poetry is written is for pleasure and you're just supposed to listen and take it in, in your five senses, it would be a lot easier for people. Who's a poet you think everybody should be reading right now? Everybody should be reading right now. Uh, well, Carl Phillips just won the Pulitzer today. Um, and I love his work. Um, and if you love playing with words and uh, syntactical fun and um, a wide range of topics, I'd pick up Carl Phillips. If we were to call up or email or text your best friends, and ask them to summarize you in a sentence. What do you think they would say about you? Uh, enthusiastic, um, productive, hardworking, um, and like fairly, fairly intense. I would say, you know, I, I I'm very focused on specific things: my writing, my sports, my oh. marriage. <laughs> <laughs> my job so yeah I think they'd say she's single-minded maybe all right you can only have one of these ballpark favorites when you go to a game what are you choosing a hot dog the pretzel the peanuts or ice cream oh. only one you only okay one. well am I let me ask you is it a meal or am I like not ravenously hungry well, we'll say not ravenously hungry. You just want to say Okay, then I'm, then I'm going with the, the pretzel with, with cheese. Must be with cheese. That's absolutely very, very good. <laughs> very, very good. What is your favorite color? Green. Excellent. If you are going on vacation outside of Chicago, where's a place you like to go? Well, we love to do go to Door County, Wisconsin, which is just a, a lovely little getaway in the in the summertime it's nice and cool up there and lots of lake michigan water to swim in so nice. not too not too sexy but it's it's a lot of fun very good very good and my last question who's going to win the world series in 2023 oh my god well i feel like at this very moment the rays have got to be the odds on favorites um but we'll see what happens um, there are a lot of really high payrolls out there. Sometimes I think with those high payroll teams that are full of veterans, they start turning it on later in the season. So we'll see if the Phillies or the Mets or the Yankees can hang in there and turn it on. I'm not sure. It won't let's be the not. Cubs. Yes. Let's <laughs> <hope not. laughs> yes. Yeah, all right. Yeah, all right. I'm glad you didn't say the Cubs. And, and, and let's hope let, let's hope the Yankees in St. Louis don't get hot and that they don't make it. So that would be no, great. I, I'm not rooting for any New York teams. <laughs> St. Louis, St. Louis come back. No, thank you. No, no thank you. <laughs> St. Louis will lose every game forever so as far as I yeah. so, so, Sandy Marchetti, thank you so much for being on the author hot seat. We appreciate that uh, so very much. Uh, and thanks for your great answers and for playing along. And I wanted to go back to uh, to your poetry collection. I want to ask you about, about one of your poems. 
Um, because yeah. I think this also ties into something that you do thematically about the, throughout the collection. Uh, Relish, I believe, is the title of the poem because um, I love it because and this reminded me of this since we were talking about what snack would you eat at the ballpark if you only had yes. to pick um, I love how, you know, in, in that particular poem, uh, th there's kind of two meanings working there. The, there's the actual relish, you know, that mm -hmm. you put on the hot dog as a condiment. Yes. But then it's more also about relishing the whole experience of, of enjoying the treat, but also the, the game itself. Mm -hmm. When you're writing about baseball in particular, does is it easy to do that to kind of take a concept like relish and, and have kind of double meanings or was that something when you were writing you just realized oh my goodness I could I could take this also in a different direction other than just writing about it as a as a food condiment how, how did that come together and was that something that you saw kind of repeated or you felt like when you were drafting the collection you saw that coming together more often than not yeah, I would say, first of all, but baseball is a great metaphor for life. It's a great metaphor for our country. Um, it's just, you know, forgive the pun, but it's teed up for you, you know? <laughs> so for me, I tell people who don't really like the game, um, who I want to read the collection, I say, think of it as a metaphor, just like any other, all of this stuff that maybe you don't like or understand, just think of it as a metaphor. Um, for sports fans, they might not, they, they see it as I'm talking about the game specifically, and then there may be something else, you know, that, that metaphor for life may be in the background. And, and I think that's fine too. Any way you want to read it is fine with me. And I think poems really deserve, you know, whatever the reader's interpretation is of the poem is the right interpretation. It's not about anything that I say. But I will say for a poem like Relish, it started out as really, and there are some short short poems in the collection that are interdispersed, like really a lot of short poems in this book, but really short ones that are interdispersed that kind of deal with one or two of the five senses really heavily. And so with Relish, I was really just thinking about what is the smell of the hot dog? What is the, the sound, the, the feeling, the touch, you know, all of these things. Um, and then by the end, I was thinking about how we consume the game, you know, and our consumption of sports in America and how it's something that we love, but in a way it could also be interpreted as, you know, adults obsessed with a children's game or just being, um, you know, perhaps capitalistic in a way that we don't realize we're even necessarily doing as fans. You know, so I thought there was room in there um, when that ending sort of came out for that double meaning. And I think that there are a lot of places in the book where uh, the book tries to look a little harder at what it means to be a fan. You know, there are several poems where I, I kind of bring in some religious imagery. Um, I grew up in a pretty um, religious household and I just see a lot of religion in the game. Um, just the things that we do when we go to the ballpark, we call ballparks cathedrals, we wear special clothes, we go and get blessings, we sing songs, you know, it reminds you of church. So just kind of looking into that a little bit deeper and maybe not really trying to make a judgment call on it, but just saying, hey, this is a part of it. Like if you haven't thought about it before, I, I see this as a part of the experience, you know, so Excellent. Excellent. So yeah. Sandy, in our, in our final moments with you uh, today here on page break, if uh, anyone wants to follow you on social media to keep track of uh, not only what's going on with aisle 228, but anything else you have going on uh, yeah. as a writer, how can they follow you on social media? How can they keep up with what you're up to? And more importantly, where can they get copies of aisle 228? Yeah. So you can go to TAMU, T-A-M-U press.com and just search in the search bar aisle 228 um and that is the the publisher texas a&m press so you can just go straight there um or you can go to amazon barnes and noble any other you know place where books are sold um if you go to a store you can request it if they don't have it in stock in the store um so that those are places you can get the book um you can find me on social media i'm at sandra poetry s-a-n-d-r-a-p-o-e-t-r-y on Twitter and Facebook. And then I'm Sandra M, as in Marchetti, my last name, Sandra M Poetry on Instagram. 
Very good. Our guest on page break today has been poet Sandra Marchetti. Her brand new collection is called Isle 228. It's about baseball and the Chicago Cubs, but so much more uh, than that. It is about that, but it is just so much more about uh, the experience of, of fathers and daughters and of humanity and what brings us together and what unites us. It's a wonderful, wonderful collection. It's her second full-length poetry collection. She's also the author of Confluence from Sundress Publications. She got her MFA in creative writing with an emphasis in poetry from George Mason University, and she currently serves as the coordinator of tutoring services at the College of DuPage in the Chicagoland area. Sandy, thanks so much for taking a page break with us today. Congratulations on your outstanding collection, and I encourage folks uh, to get it. Whether you, If you don't like baseball at all, it's a great way to get into poetry for the first time or get back into poetry. So congratulations to you and all the best and all the most success to you with the book. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. We want to take a moment and remind you to go over to the tab over here on the right and make sure that you subscribe to our channel. Be sure you leave any comments or questions in the comments fields below. And if you have any specific questions for Sandy, we'll be sure and pass those along to you so that you can get a response. If you're watching us on Instagram, please be sure that you like the little heart right below here, indicating that uh, you've enjoyed what you've heard. And if you want to leave any questions or comments in the comments fields on Instagram, we'll be sure and send those along to Sandy as well. Well, that's going to do it for us uh, on page breaks. Stay well and see you someplace soon, I hope. Thank you.